Before we begin, do you want to talk a little bit about your background and how you got involved in the UFO community? Uh, yeah, sure. So it really all goes back to my childhood. I was three or four years old, which I think makes it like 83 or 84, something like that. I'm uh, 43 right now. And okay. I saw, I think it was the first time I saw a UFO. I was uh, living in Fort Kent, Maine, which is way at the tip of Maine, uh, right next to Canada. Uh, in fact, I actually used to get my haircuts in Canada and we lived right on the St. John River. Uh, I could actually like, I guess nowadays, maybe not then, but nowadays I could probably throw a rock and hit Canada. It, it was that close. <laughs> wow. And uh, so I fell asleep one night and this loud boom or bang or something woke me up. So, uh, you know, my eyes are kind of like darting around to figure out what the hell it was. And then I start hearing like these little light taps on my window and I was like, oh, it's rain. And then I saw the sky lighting up and uh, I was like, oh, a, a thunder and lightning storm. So I knelt up on my bed and I'm watching the lightning, you know, and even then at three or four years old, I knew that you just see lightning for like less than a second, you know? So I'm, mm. I'm hearing booms and it's raining and uh, I'm seeing little streaks of lightning here and there. And then all of a sudden there was this really obscene bolt of lightning. Uh, at least that's how I remember it. Like if I were to ask you to draw a lightning bolt, you would draw like this jagged, short, jagged yellow line, you know, or, or kind of like the charging yeah. indicator on your smartphone. It, it looked mm. like that. And it was stuck in a cloud. And I just, oh, I, wow. I knew that wasn't right. So I kept staring at it and there's electricity coming off of it and there's booms happening and it's just stuck there in this cloud. And I really don't know what happened next. I, I guess I fell asleep. I woke up in the morning, went to the bathroom. And when I'm walking back from the bathroom to my bedroom, I can see out my bedroom window and I can see that the yeah. lightning bolt is still there. And I'm like, that's crazy. So I ran downstairs to get my dad, brought him upstairs to show him the lightning bolt that was stuck in a cloud and it was gone. So wow. I must have been really excited because I was like, no, no, no. You know, like I'm trying to explain myself, you know, how a little kid is. And, oh, yeah. and, and my dad was being the typical parent of a little kid and just kind of like ruffling my hair and be like, yeah, yeah, OK, you know, well, there's nothing there now. But I think it's I was probably a bad dream. So. Yeah, yeah. So. Yeah. I think I was really insistent uh, or maybe I was getting more hysterical than I remember or something, but he had to like kneel down and get on my level and like put his hand on my shoulders. And he was like, listen, mm -hmm. it didn't even rain last night. There was no storm. Like, I, I don't know what you're talking about. And oh, that's wild. yeah. So even at that age, I knew, I, you know, I wasn't thinking aliens or anything paranormal because I didn't know what that was. I was just like, that's yep. weird, you know, and it it kind of scared me, you know? So a couple of weeks later, I'm being woke up. I'm being woken up in the middle of the night and my mom and dad have woken me and my sister up to go outside to see the Northern lights. And again, I'm three or four years old. I have no idea if it's like 10 o'clock at night or if it's like three in the morning. I, I just know it just mm. felt really late, you know, and they take us outside and I can remember it like it was yesterday and the sky was filled with these crazy like ribbons of like color. And I, I really remember green sticking out quite a bit. So like, I think those two experiences happening really close to each other at such a young age, I think it instilled in me that like weird shit happens in the sky and I should probably look up and pay attention, you know? So oh, yeah, definitely. that was like the catalyst of just paying attention to my surroundings for quote unquote weird things, you know, because I, I, you know, I still didn't know what I was looking for. It wasn't until I got yeah. to be like a teenager, I might have been 12, but like 13 or 14, maybe when I was like, oh, my goodness, that might have been the first time I saw a UFO What that, whatever the hell that lightning bolt was, you know, because even when I think mm. about, about it now. I see a lightning bolt. I see that jagged yellow lightning bolt. I don't see a UFO, you know, but that's, I guess, how my brain processed it. So getting into my teenage years, I'm starting, I'm really into the paranormal and I'm collecting a, a bunch of stories. You know, you don't really know what to do, or at least for me anyways, my experience was, I don't know what to do with these stories. I'm just collecting them and, and, and consuming them because I love them so much. 
And yeah. I, as I was getting into my later teens and my early 20s, uh, I, I'm reading a ton of books on UFOs and the paranormal, you know, Bigfoot, just a bunch of different stuff. And I get the dumb idea, like in my early 20s, like, hey, there's no book written about UFOs, uh, uh, solely about UFOs in Maine. There's tons of uh, ghost books about uh, ghosts in Maine. There are other books that have UFO stories in them, but among other mm. paranormal things. So I was like, I'm going to write that book <laughs> and uh, didn't know what the hell I was doing. Uh, I still don't, but I, I definitely didn't know what I was doing uh, back then. But it took me like six or seven years like to write. And then it took like a couple of years to like get it published. It was a whole thing. But it, uh, I, I, I don't know, I guess long story short, it went from three or four years old having a sighting and it just kind of snowballed into collecting stories and sticking out stories. Yeah. Yeah. You like in your book, the stories, they, they're very vast. Like they cover multiple different time periods and generations. Yeah, like, sure. I think I remember reading from like the 1800s, yeah. like a sighting. All the way back then. Yeah, pretty crazy stuff, man. So that, that first book I was telling you about took me like six years to write or whatever. That's my first book called UFOs Over Maine. The second book okay. is still all Maine based stories, but the publisher was like, well, we, we want to get away from the regional title. So we're, you know, what do you, can you give us some alternate titles? So that's where Otherworldly Encounters came from. Uh, but again, still all Maine stories. And the ones, there's a, a couple from the 1800s. But one of them uh, with Reverend uh, Abraham, uh, th this story has been told as a ghost story, and it's still being told mm -hmm. as a ghost story. There was a book published, I think, in 2016, 2014, about Nellie Butler, who haunted uh, this area of Sullivan, Maine. And people would hear her disembodied voice and, and, and all this stuff. So this Reverend uh, Abraham uh, was in that area during that time. And he heard the stories about Nellie Butler. And he had a couple of experiences himself, which he attributed to the ghost of Nellie Butler. But when I read the story, reading it through my lens, it sounded to me like a possible extraterrestrial story. So I wanted to, to put it in the book and let the reader decide, you know, but he's, he's out walking in this field and he sees this glowing white rock, like, uh, uh, you know, in the grass and he's watching it and he's like, you know, that's peculiar. And then it, uh, it, it levitates and, and starts moving up. And to me, that sounds like a landed UFO taking off. Oh, yeah. And so now it's hovering and he's hearing uh, uh, voices in his head, which he is attributing to a disembodied voice of Nellie Butler. But to me, that could potentially be telepathic communications with a potential extraterrestrial. Uh, so at one point, this rock goes away and then he, he sees an actual entity and it looks like a small child at first, and then it kind of shape shifts into a, a full grown person. And again, he's attributing that to being the, the visual embodiment of the ghost of M Nellie Butler. And to me, that sounds like a shape shifting alien, <laughs> potentially, you know? Yeah, definitely. And, and uh, so he's talking to this entity telepathically because he's not opening his mouth or anything. And then he has this period of missing time. And, and he doesn't really know what happens. And next thing he knows, he's not in the field anymore. He's back at his cabin. And he's like, how did I get here? And he, he goes outside and, you know, there's no more white rock or any entity or anything. But, you know, to me, that kind of plays out as a uh, missing time, a potential abduction and uh, abductees have been uh, have reported being left in a slightly different area than they were before. It's not what vastly different, like in another state or anything, but maybe a few miles from where they were or something like that. Uh, so I thought that was just a fascinating story that was published uh, originally back in the 1800s, and then subsequent retellings of it has come out again as recently as 2014, 2016, all being told as a ghost story. And uh, when I read at least this specific account of uh, Reverend Abraham uh, and his mm -hmm. his um, connection to Nellie Butler, that to me read like a potentially extraterrestrial encounter. So I wanted to make sure to share that in the book, you know. Well, definitely with all the, the missing time and the you know, lost memories and stuff like that. That's 
pretty common throughout a lot of the stories in your book. Sure. Now, do you think the, the missing times directly tied in with an abduction? Uh, I mean, not necessarily. It, uh, uh, it Honestly, everything that we're discussing is just like conjecture. And you first yeah. have to get behind the fact that, uh, you know, whether or not you believe in, in extraterrestrials or aliens, you know. And then if you can go beyond that, then that starts, there are levels of belief uh, regarding like, uh, can people be abducted? Are people being abducted? Or are you of the scientific nature where, where we're in this huge universe? And so obviously aliens exist, but a lot of people in the scientific community uh, don't think that they're coming here, you know, and, and, and uh, communicating with us. So there's, you know, kind of two different sides to, to, to look at it. And for me, Regardless of my belief, I find these stories fascinating. So when it comes to something like missing time, again, you're already at that point where you probably believe in UFOs if you're or aliens mm. if you're into this type of story. And uh, with missing time, I guess what I've seen in uh, the people that I've talked to, it's not always surrounding an abduction potentially there are things called screen memories and screen memories okay. are when you're having some sort of uh ufo or, or extraterrestrial encounter uh but that uh what actually happened is blocked in your memory and instead it is replaced with maybe you saw a deer or an owl or experienced something oh. more mundane and what comes with that is you might recall the time at one point, especially if you're driving or you, you just happen to notice the time, but then that screen memory comes in. And then the next thing you know, it's one or two or three or four hours later. And again, you're, you're just kind of remembering maybe being in a field and seeing a deer. Next thing you know, it's two hours later and you're in your bed, you know, and, and you don't really know uh, how you got there.